to Maxed Out Man, helping you become the man you were made to be. Hey guys, it's Kevin Davis from the Maxed Out Man podcast. This is episode number 39. I am here with Sean Harvey. Sean is the chief compassion officer and founder of the Warrior Compassion Men's Studio and the Symponia Facilitator Studio. See how well my uh, Babble app has been working for me, which if yeah. I did it more often, it'd probably be working better. But uh, Sean, I appreciate you being here. I'm going to let you kind of tell your story and, and what you do. We were talking before we started recording that this will be an interesting topic for me personally to kind of get, to, and honestly, this podcast, that's been the most exciting part of this whole thing is kind of learning from different people, exploring my own masculinity, my own inner self, yeah. uh, and all that. So, hey, thanks for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. No, you're welcome, man. It's, it's great to be here. So thanks for having me. Thanks for asking. So, hey, tell me, tell me what, kind of give us your background. You got a few letters after your name. You've got, I looked at your website last night in preparation for this, and it's like tab, 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 speaker, author. <laughs> like you, you, you do a lot of things, and I think you're helping a lot of people. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, I think I'll, I'll start with, um, yeah, I've been on this journey for probably about 10, 10 probably about a decade. I really started when I when I left Wall Street at 40. I was a consultant on Wall Street. I was a college professor. And I gave it all up on my 40th birthday and told my the CEO of the firm I was uh, I was leading a consulting division at that time in New York and I, I walked into her office and said, you know, I've lost my heart, my soul on the job and and I resigned as my birthday present. Wow. And and within 2 weeks this this uh, fashion company that I'd never heard of, Eileen Fisher, was was looking for an internal consultant. And a friend of mine said, hey, we're hiring. And he said, you know, I think I'd be curious. I'm, I think I'd be interested. And that that was really the start of this journey. Wow. And did they hire you for something specific for the as a consultant? So I was the internal chain. I came in as an internal organization development partner or in simple terms, I was an internal change agent for the creative teams. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. That's, so would, that's in that company at Eileen Fisher, I was pretty much running retreats. And so I was pretty much developing and, and running full day retreats. I think my second year, I, I led 52, 50, 56 full days of retreats in a year, my second year. Um, but it was, it was what happened on my first day that I think was the the moment that kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And so Eileen Fisher, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a women's fashion company um, based out of New York. And um, it's, it's really run from a place of feminine leadership, feminine, um, a feminine energy company. And I, you know, coming from wall street and college teaching, <laughs> this was like, if everything I knew about organizations got flipped on its head, Right. But it was on that first day, my two bosses sat me down for lunch and I had just come, gone through an eight month interview to get the job. And they said, you know, Sean, we just want to acknowledge that you have proven yourself in the interview process. We now want you to stop proving yourself and learn how to be who you actually are. Interesting. When you, in, when you interviewed with us, you showed us your heart and you showed us your polish. We hired you for your heart and we want to see less of your polish. Stop trying to prove and, and share your accomplishments and achievements and all these things that as guys were typically like trained that this is this is our calling card. And they're like, that's not going to work here. That mask kind of a thing. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so it was uh, it was it was it was challenging the mask right out of the gate. Um and over the course, I was there for five years and I started noticing this this company was just different. You know, it, it operated differently. The conversations were different. Um, there was less focus on outcomes and more focus on process. We spent more time in the nuance. And it was a company that was about 1,200 employees and about 200 were men. It's the first time being in a female-dominated <laughs> environment. Yeah. And and learn, I learned a lot. I, I had a, I, I hit my head on the, hit my head against the wall a few times, a few too many times. Um. And, but what I noticed when I started talking to other men was, you know, I would say, yo, I, I feel like I'm changing. Are you changing this? Has this place impacted you? And they were like, 
yeah, you know, my wife said, and it usually started with my wife or my girlfriend. <laughs> Uh, my wife said I, I, I'm more patient or I listen differently. Um, I stopped needing to be right all the time and I started to be more curious. I started to have more access to my emotional expression. Um, and I started to be more creative. I tapped into my creativity differently and I was starting to, to solve problems in a new ways. Mm. But the biggest thing was most of the guys said, I feel more comfortable in my own skin than I ever have. And, you know, I, I've been through men's work. I've, you know, I, I lead men's work and, and this was different. This was like organically just happening to guys without them even realizing what was happening. And they were just shifting, they were evolving, they were morphing. And I said, you know, we got to bring this, we got to bring whatever this is out to more men. And that, that my journey um, in, in the book that I just wrote, that just published is really the starting place is, is, you know, at 40, going on this journey with Eileen Fisher, and then everything that came after it over the last decade. Um, my healing and now having a roadmap for other men's healing. And that book is Warrior Compassion, right? Just I, I went on, I went on Amazon this morning. So it it uh, it launched just a few weeks ago, right? Just, just a couple a few of weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yeah. Nice. Congratulations on Thank on getting that out. And by healing, first of all, let me just say that over in 2017, my wife, who had been a homemaker to that time, started doing uh, off road rallies. We we built um, we built a vehicle for her. She actually built most of it, and then she got involved in all female automotive builds. Uh, I don't know if you know what SEMA is. It's coming up in a little bit. It's the Special Equipment at Manufacturers Association, it's the largest automotive um, trade show in the world. She's had multiple vehicles in that as a kind of a, a homemaker turned, you know, That's race similar. car build, you know, race car builder, rally driver, welder, fabricator, all of this stuff, which is a it's an awesome story. But it, we were involved in all female built. So like there's 80 tradeswomen and they're welders and fabricators and car builders and painters and race car drivers. So like. It, it was an interesting dynamic for me because there was oftentimes an I'm the I'm the only guy anywhere to be found. And, um, you know, obviously these women, I would I would guess they are slightly different than fashion, right. fashion women. They, they tend to lean more towards the masculine, you know, just as by nature. Uh, right. But there was still this femininity. Uh, and our, our exploration was kind of interesting because there, there was almost this, they put on their own masks to hide their femininity right. because they're existing in a masculine world. So I thought that right. was super, super interesting. And that's an interesting journey that you've had as well. You know, I think it's, um, you know, having, having worked and, and consulted for 25 years, um, I, I see that, you know, our systems have been built from a masculine perspective. And so it's really asking everyone in corporate America to put on a mask in some way. I think that's shifting now, but traditionally. Mm -hmm. So in so many of these male dominated environments, it is leaning more into the masculine energy than the feminine energy um, across the gender continuum, the gender, the gender spectrum. So, um, you know, I think, I think right now we're at a point where the, the rules, roles, norms, expectations around gender are just shifting so radically and so quickly. You know, I often say, you know, and for a lot of men, it's just like getting whiplash <laughs> of, of, of what's happening. And then also the flip side of it is not giving men the space to even just contemplate, reflect, or even just say, how, how am I with all of this? Mm -hmm. And that's the whole, that's even the whole premise of, of my book is I think right now, men, and especially white straight men, are the, also known as the enemy of society. <laughs> no, and that you know that's the thing. It's like so many men are hearing the messages that something has to change. They have to change because they or something is broken. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise of my book is: No, you're not broken. There's not something that's broken. But there are probably a lot of men out there that are deeply wounded who are suffering in silence that just need an invitation into the healing journey that's less about fixing the problem, more about healing the wounds. And, and, what, and, 
Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, and what, like when you, when you said healing and wounds, I'm just, you know, can you give us a little bit of context on that and kind of what that might look like? Yeah. You know, I think, um, I describe a lot of guys who come onto their healing journey and like there's, there's usually something that happens. Um, sometimes it's, I, I, I played by the rules. I played the game. I got the prizes. I'm still unfulfilled or I'm still something's missing or I'm miserable. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the biggest thing is we're in this epidemic of loneliness, especially in the U S where men we're just seeing statistically are having fewer friends, fewer, deeper connections. I think social media has just exasperated faux intimacy versus real intimacy and real connection mm -hmm. and when i when i when i as i've been in it i think what so many men are yearning for is deeper connection deeper connection to self to other um to their own sense of their authentic core and so i think it's that that disconnection that is often the culprit and what that can translate to is feelings of isolation and loneliness feelings of unfulfillment, feelings of depression. It can, it can, um, you know, we can often mask or cope with addictive behaviors, you know, and then when we look at where we are in terms of the rates of suicide mm -hmm. and some of my work goes into working with, with police officers and military. And when I look at the, the, the numbers with police officers, it just, everything just gets, like it's double, tripled or quadrupled in terms of the, the, um, you know, walking with the trauma from the job mm -hmm. and not having the outlets to release it. And I think that's the thing we just, you know, for the most part, personal transformation work, healing work, the growth work, the spiritual growth work, it's much more accessible. It's accessible for women mm -hmm. in terms of, I think, one, a propensity for it Two, there's more available for it. And three, there's less of a stigma around it. And so I think for men, it's like, how do we just create more of these invitations where there's less stigma, there's less of this is a sign of weakness, this is a sign of something's wrong, and more of, no, this is just a reflection of you being a human being. And this is just normally going to just make you a better, healthier human. You know, one of one of the guys on my like we um, we co-founded an organization or, or an initiative called Project Compassion, which was deepening compassion in police departments. And it was like five of five or six of us found each other. And one one guy is the on the team is the former head of the FBI National Academy at Quantico. And we had a conversation one day and at the end of it, and I was giving like my, my perspective, a lot of what's in my book. And, you know, he said, you know, Sean, I, I can't argue, refute, or rebut anything you just said. You're not talking about training cops to be better cops. You're talking about developing officers into better humans who can argue with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's really the invitation to help men come into their, their humanness and their humanity in a different way. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, it's interesting that you talk about cops, FBI soldiers, you know, cause I think if there's any group that is like rub some dirt in it, kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, th that tends to be the culture. I'm sure it's interesting because we've been, I got, you know, like late at night, I typically kind of watch a show of some sort on Hulu or whatever. And I got addicted to watching these, uh, body cam shows okay. for, for whatever reason but and obviously these shows are are curated specifically to show certain stories but but one of the things that i noticed very heavily about this show is that um and one thing's that like i didn't really realize this so when there's an officer involved shooting so a suspect they have to shoot a suspect in order to neutralize the threat they instantly go from that action to trying to save the suspect's life so you have this group of cops that literally just put 15 bullets in this guy who then instantly turn into EMTs trying to get this, you know, trying to, and oftentimes it, it doesn't happen, but I was struck by, and that's one story. Their guy was 
pull had to pull a suspect out of a burning vehicle last night who basically tried to kill him and all, all these things but it's that compassion side that was actually surprising especially now because to your point cops not only are they, you know if you're a single you know white male who happens to be a cop you're like worse than you know the worst car salesman out there right like you, you you're not a loved person in the right. general public so i thought that was super interesting what we what we've been seeing on that yeah you know i think it's um you know when i when i the so many of the men that i meet it's like we we have so many preconceived of what compa preconceived ideas of what compassion is some will say it's a sign of weakness some will say that it's you know not accessible some will you know shun it and yet when you really look at our behaviors so many men are, are, are already being compassionate in their way um and one of the things that i do in the book is i talk about the spiritual foundations you know how and i i introduce the definitions of compassion through eight different uh traditions faith traditions so christianity judaism uh Islam, or Islam, um, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, uh, shamanic practice and, um, integral spirituality as an interfaith minister, you know, just kind of seeing what's an interfaith perspective. And so uh, just to give some of the spiritual grounding for why this work has been around <laughs> for essentially eternity, you know, for centuries and centuries. And it really is at the foundation of so many of our faith traditions, you know, and we, we manifest it in different ways and it doesn't necessarily need to be a feminine expression to, to show compassion. And, and I think what, what's challenging is for so many men, I think are blocked emotionally that we can intellectualize these ideas. We put them in action, but it can be hard for us to feel the visceral experience of, of being compassionate. And I think that's really the opportunity is helping men feel in a different way and ultimately helping men love in a new way. And when I talk about love, I, I you know, I think so many of us have, as men and as, as just people have been taught that love comes with conditions, mm. right? And that if we don't have the, the full access to our emotional expression, then we are, it's easy to, to intellectualize what love is. It's, it's, it's easy to feel the endorphins that come with love. Right. But then when the love wane, like when those endorphins wane and it becomes just normal, you know, then we can really have a misunderstood idea of what love is. Yeah. And if we've learned love with conditions, we can often put love with conditions, those expectations on others and, and also ourselves. And so that's why when I, I when I think about when I think about compassion, I always think about that love is at the root of it. And it's really moving from this idea of love with conditions to this visceral experience of unconditional love. And what does it look like when men have the experience to be able to really give and receive unconditional love freely? And what becomes possible? And that's really the whole premise of the book. Yeah, that um yeah, I think the receiving of unconditional love m mm -hmm. might be, you know, more difficult of the two for a lot of right. for a, for a lot of men. It's funny you talk about faith. I'm an evangelical Christian, so um, and we 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 watch this show called The Chosen. I'm not I'm mm -hmm. not sure you're familiar with it, but I I love the portrayal of Jesus in that because to me, as a man, he is like the quintessential um, example, obviously as a Christian, um, you know, it, it's, it's an important example, but he, uh, you know, the dude was a carpenter. He was not a frail man. Like, you know, some Catholic art would <laughs> portrayal. He didn't look like he wasn't feminine in any way, you know, carpenters at that point didn't have skill saws and, and table saws and all that. Everything was done by hand. They're picking, you know, picking up big timbers. So he would actually been a fit, what would be des defined as masculine. Right. But his level of, you know, unconditional love to the extreme, but his whole message is come to me no matter what you've done, who you are, like it, it doesn't matter. 
like those things, because that's the true unconditional love from his perspective. And, and having those two sides of him is a great example, you know, whether you believe in the Bible or any of that stuff or not looking at Jesus as a, as a man and as a person um, is something that has always been super attractive to me, you know, as an example to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> um, I've had this conversation a number of times. So it was actually when I was in seminary that this whole notion for me um, and, and what I coined was this, this idea of compassionate masculinity. What if masculinity was wrapped in compassion? What would that look like? Um, and it really was this idea of as men, if we come into our integrated masculine feminine, you know, the best qualities of both, you know, and we start to, we come into a different level of balance, you know, and we're able to, to, and I think the best description is balancing strength with tenderness, mm -hmm. right. Or, or strength with sensitivity, um, that, you know, compassion, masculinity, warrior compassion is all about the integration and the blend. And when we come into our full selves, that's what makes us fully human. And, you know, and I, I, I never, I never use words like toxic masculinity. I never talk about, cause I don't think it is. Right. I, I, I have a sign on my wall that says, uh, toxic masculine, masculinity is not toxic. Some men can suck. <laughs> so right. it's, a, there, yeah. there, it's not a toxic masculinity. It could be just someone, you know, a person that is conveying themselves as toxic. You know? Well, I think it's, it's a construct, right? It's a construct that was created. What I find is it's a construct that men, that, that a number of men have just gleaned onto. That's their identity. Yeah. Right. And without, with, with the absence of, of access or stigma around the feminine. And so we're, we're kind of operating imbalanced and kind of lopsided. Mm-hmm. Right. But what that that feminine energy gives us and, and I distinguish between the masculinity and femininity and masculine and feminine energy and that those energies, when we are able to tap into them and become more balanced. I mean, that's that's what gives us the ability to be strong and also to be compassionate. Um, what I find is in, in a lot of spaces and working with men, we're either right doing one of two things where they're coming in hyper masculine and, and trying to beat the emotions out of us to get us to feel something. Yeah, push that way, way, way down. Right. And then <laughs> down they, they beat it until it comes up. And then you just, you know, but the flip side of it is, and what I've seen in a lot of conscious communities is there's such a demonization of the masculine mm -hmm. that it's all in the feminine. And, and, and then it, then it, we're moving into this emasculation of men. Right. And I think what we're, we're, we're navigating in the world is as the world, as the, as the feminine becomes more elevated, is how do we support men to navigate a changing world without emasculating men in the process? And that's why I think this is the, this is the balance of how do we come integrated? How do we become whole? How do we unblock the, the, the wounds that are holding us from love? You know, and as an interfaith minister, I, I really subscribe to um, the teachings of Christ. I subscribe to shamanic practice and just the connection to the earth. I'm also part Cherokee, I talk about them in the book. And so, and then um, one of the most transcendent transformational experiences I had in seminary was was learning about the Sufi, Sufi traditions and Sufi wisdom. And, and a lot, you know, you can translate it to like Rumi poetry and so mm. much of it is around the, 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 the joy of the soul, the, 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 the dancing and the play of the soul. But really it's, it's really saying, how do we unblock the wound? So if Jesus is saying, you know, the message is love. The Sufis are saying, how do you unblock what's, what's, what's holding you back? Where are the cracks for the love to come through? Mm, okay. And how can you expand the possibility of love for yourself so that you, the more we love ourselves, that's that, that begets then the love that we can have for others. Yeah.
Do you, one of the things we've talked about on this podcast a few times with different guests is just my concern for young men now, especially, I mean, you're, you're about my age, I'm 50. Um, and you know, when we were growing up, it probably leaned towards the other side of the continuum, right? right. It's, you know, hyper-masculine in sports and, and all right. of those kind of growing up, but it, it seems like now, and I don't know if you can talk to this at all in your study, but these young guys, 16, 17, 18, and, and in that early twenties, like I, I feel for them because I don't think that they know how to become men. Like, I don't think there's any, because it's such a dynamic and honestly weird time <laughs> in that way. And in, in some cases they're told that it's not okay to, to right. you know, lean into masculinity. It's if you lean into feminine energy, then you're this or that, you know? And so I'm, I'm curious, like what, what you're seeing in that regard, you know, for my own edification <laughs> more than anything, but, but that's kind of what we've talked about a lot. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, I think, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. I think there's just a lot of confusion. You know, when you are told that there's something wrong with your gender and you're getting that message, um, that's, that's going to, that's going to impact your psyche. And, and I find when, when, when young men, and I'll say, um, when I have 20 somethings come into my groups, they're often coming in from this place that they've talked about. Um, you know, why well, I keep hearing the masculine is bad. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work I'm doing is no, the masculine is good. We need this. <laughs> we just don't need so much of it that it's out of balance. And then it's creating more problems for us. Right. And so, um, I, I think boys, young men and, and men, you know, I think, I think some of what we're missing is we're missing some of this intergenerational connection. Mm -hmm. I think we're missing some of the mentoring, um, you know, and, and I talk about this, but, you know, as a, as a gay man who came out at 16 or 15 in 1990, I'm, I just turned 50 myself. So, um, you know, I was 16, I started a gay and lesbian youth group for the city of Dayton, Ohio, which still exists today. Um, cause I, I wanted a safe space for, for gay men and lesbian. That's, you know, it's pretty much all the community was back then. Yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't have as many letters in 1990. Um, to have a safe place to come out, you know, cause what I was doing, I was sneaking into gay bars at, at 16 and like, and I'm like, wait, what, you know, what, what's happening here? And that wasn't, that wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, and so, you know, I think right now we're just, we're seeing a lot of, we're, we're, we're like I was saying, the, the intergenerational piece, the mentoring piece, you know, I mean, for me, you know, the generation before me was wiped out with AIDS mm -hmm. pretty much. And then I, th I think when I was 45, someone said, you know, you're an, you're an elder in the community. I'm like, I'm only 45. <laughs> I'm not ready to be an elder. Right. <laughs> but it, but it showed me the, the, um, the need for the mentoring, you know, probably even we need more mentoring than we need coaches at this point. I think. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think to, to, you know, I think two things are missing one, the intergenerational mentoring. And then two, what so many folks before us had were were sent were rites of passage and initiation hey guys thanks for listening to this episode i hope you're enjoying it and learning a lot if you're looking for extra help don't forget that i do offer one-on-one -on -one coaching we can talk through a ton of different issues i can give you guides guidelines and logistical help to help you take that next step or go to that next level in some of the things that you're dealing with in your life we also have some course content, some guides, uh, and a lot of educational materials over at maxedoutman.com. For the coaching, go ahead and go to maxedoutman.com slash coaching, and you can learn about that. And then just go to maxedoutman.com for everything else. Thanks for joining us. Now back to the episode. You know, um, it just came natural with, 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 you know, that we just don't have, mm -hmm. you know, 
even if it was the, you know, going into the military or going into service, mm -hmm. you know, of some sort, we just, we just don't have that these days. And so I think there's just not the, the, the structures in place that support men and young men as we're trying to navigate. And I think then we have, um, like I said, I'll keep coming back to, you know, social media is in, in some ways is great. In other ways, it's, it's, I think it's kind of killing us. Oh, I, I, I lean towards the destroying our society side of that. I mean, I yeah. see the value in it, but it, you know, if you look at, I mean, just statistically and timelines and those graphs, yeah. it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you add a, a pandemic and isolation. I think that's, a, that's exasperated both the isolation, the loneliness, um, and not necessarily navigating the, being able to navigate the gender, the shifting gender roles and roles. And I think we're just creating more divides between men and women. And then when you add the conversations around trans and non-binary, that's just creating even more confusion for a lot of men, mm -hmm. you know? For sure. And so I think it's, I think we're, we are in, um, just really challenging times for, for men and, and young men to navigate. How do I find my way? Yeah. I remember I was on, a, I was on a, I was on a talk with other men's work leaders. I remember the guy before me was saying, you know, we need to, we need to show young men the way. And I, I came up right after and I said, no, we don't. We don't need what, to show what, which, what is the way? Right, exactly. <laughs> so we, don't, we don't need to show men young men the way I think we need to ask young men the questions so that they can be in an inquiry to find their way. Right. I think it's really, and when I, when I, the way I look at, you know, the ways we deepen our own, even our spiritual understanding. Cause I think when I, when I look at all the challenges out there, I just say, you know, when, my first reaction is a lot of men are in spiritual crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have, when I look at, and I go into faith organizations, I go into churches. I'm like, at this point, I'm like, okay, so it's like 89% women. Where are the men? Where do men go for spiritual discussions? And so the other element of my book is, is even just to make this accessible, like practical spirituality for dudes mm. of like, just because I, I think they're not ready to go like in my book, go to, go to Asheville and live with shamans and, <laughs> and mystics. But I do think get out the ayahuasca and let's go yeah, to town, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, those sorts of things. But I do think a lot of men have a lot of spiritual questions that they're just not asking or mm -hmm. don't have a place to ask. And when we, when we move to, you know, the atheist agnostic, spiritual, not religious, you know, where do you go for spiritual community? Where do you go for that inner compass, that sacred compass, that moral compass of how you navigate the world? So I think there's also that, that dimension that I speak more to that I don't often hear in a lot of men's circles mm -hmm. is, yeah. is the spiritual component without being overly religious. They may turn some folks off, but really an invitation to say, there is a, a, a spiritual path for you that your soul is calling you to walk. You know, how do you, how to help you get quieter to listen and then find your way. Yeah. And, and even with that, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a navigation that, that becomes difficult. Cause I always call, <laughs> I joke and call it, you know, leaning into the woo, -woo which yeah. is, you know, that, that stuff, which has its own stigma and, and, you know, that I lean more towards conservative Christianity and right. uh, obviously, but you know, I, to your point about mentoring, I'm curious, you know, it seems like too, as somebody that's, you know, if I wanted to try to mentor a young person, first of all, trying to have that connection because it's, you know, the, it's a little crazy, but then also having that freedom to what, how I can and can't share my own experiences, my own, cause I lean more conservative. Like, is it okay to talk about my values and without, without even trying to enforce them on someone? or indoctrinate them or whatever, but just to give my perspective, because I, I feel like in, in my case, a, you know, 50 year old, you know, long-term married monogamous white male, you know, Christian, how do you like, am I able to then share my experiences, my knowledge, my values with a young man, just as a perspective, not necessarily as like, you need to be just like me kind of a thing. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's um, it's crazy where we are right now, isn't it? That that you have to ask that question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That you didn't like growing up. That never would have been a question. No. And today it is a question. And that's that's why you know my my belief is one we all have a story and we all have a journey, mm-hmm. and that we can share our experiences, we can share our journeys, and that we can share it from the perspective as long as we're not saying this is the way, but we can say this was my way and this is what worked for me, mm-hmm. and this is what gave me joy, this is what gives me happiness, this is what gives me meaning. And then I think if we can then, as a mentor, ask the questions, so what what resonates for you in that? What questions do you have? What doesn't resonate for you? So I think if we can hold our story loosely, not tightly, and I think if we can honor that the person in front of us, it may not be that, that, that my journey um, is your journey. It doesn't have to be. But I do think that um, sharing from, from our experiences of what works, how to navigate, to be a sounding board, to, to ask the questions and, and have, have young men feel free to ask us questions. Um, and, and I, I don't think coming from a conservative religious Christian perspective, you know, I, I, I tend to be someone who works primarily with conservatives. <laughs> Mm. And so <laughs> it just happens to be that this is this is the community that that I have probably the most connection with. Interesting. And my, my boyfriend is a Republican conservative. And is that even allowed? I thought there was like some sort of set of rules that you guys are handed out. <laughs> you're, you're look, you realize I don't go by rules. So. <laughs> well, I have to for sure. Um. And so I, I think it's, you know, and I, I find that so many conservatives are, are now at a point where they're afraid to share their views, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and many of them say, I'm a moderate, but anything that I say is going to come off like I'm on the right, so yeah. far on the right. And, and that's, that's, that's not okay. It's, it's, you know, if, we, if we're really, and I was in a conversation recently talking about how do we engage all men? How do we create a national initiative to engage men around healthy masculinity? It was a, it was a national conference or discussion. And I noticed it was very much a um, progressive conversation. And it was very much we, the Democrats, and them, the, the Republicans. And, and I just kind of stood up and I said, okay, right, so if we want to create a national initiative, the first thing we have to do is get beyond our partisanship. Right very partisan conversation. And I can tell you right now that your progressive language can't be heard by conservative ears at this point. We are so divided. So I think we need to get beyond identity and politics and go to the next level, which is how do we speak from our shared humanity of our collective we? And that's going to be the ways that we engage, can start engaging men across the continuum. And I think the other piece is, you know, what I find is the more I talk humanity, um, and, and that's how I'm, you know, when I when I start bringing in the humanity conversation, because I think what we really do in our interactions is we are mirrors of each other's humanity. Mm. We are we are reminders of our humanity. When I was a college professor, I would always tell my students, you know, I'm not teaching you rocket science. I would teach org behavior, organizational change, um, management, leadership. So I'm just teaching you common sense practices that aren't commonly practiced. I'm just reminding you of what's already within you. And I think that's, that's, that's really, you know, the more we can see each other in our humanity, you know, the more that we can see, even if I'm, we might be diametrically opposed in some of our views, if we can just acknowledge, okay, those are our views, but that's not our humanity. Mm -hmm. And then I, I see, You know, the way you love your children, the way you care about um, your community, maybe how you feel about the environment, you know, whatever the, wherever you're really showing, like, where's your heart? Where's your, where's your compassion? Where's your connection? Yeah. You know, and then the, the question is, and where are you disconnected? You know, 
And that's within you. That's not you in your relationship to society. That's just within you. Where's where's the inner turmoil? Yeah. And that's the place to start, you know, finding peace. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the that's the opportunity we have here. And that's the opportunity I think that we have with men is to be able because I, I find that so many men are just like yeah, in some sort of inner turmoil without with very few places to be able to express it or very few outlets to be able to do it in a healthy way. Right. Yeah. And and that's, that's the opportunity. And I think society right now, especially with the narratives and media and all that, like we, they want us to believe that everyone is on both ends of that continuum, right. Between conservative and super liberal. And like you, like you pointed out, I think most people are in the moderate, you know, we have our, we have our particular, beliefs on on certain hot button topics but that doesn't necessarily define who we are you know my daughter is is a lesbian married to a woman i'm a conservative christian dad obviously that that would not have been the lifestyle that i i had envisioned but we we love her and and it's interesting because and i i've i don't think i've ever told this story before but but basically when she was when she came out to us and had that conversation, she's like, well, I know you're going to love me anyway. And, and having that, um, having that, uh, her faith in that love was, was super important to us. And and we've had conversation about, you know, weddings and marriage and, and all of those things and be able to navigate that in an open and honest way with her. And we absolutely love, her wife. We've, you know, I consider now I have three daughters instead of two daughters. She's actually in the army deployed right now. So be able to have these conversations as dad to a, to a soldier, you know, and, and all of those things. And, and like you would, if you just looked at my quote unquote, you know, societal resume and you left that part out, you would, you would never be able to believe that that part of my story is true. Right. Because we're, we're told that that's not, that's not okay. You're supposed to kick that kid out and never love them and never talk to them again. And, and I think that's the narrative that we're told, um, you know, in society. Yeah. I think, um, there's two things there, you know, I think the supposed to, when we start, when we start realizing we're using the word should, you know, that's the opportunity to get curious and say, okay, but why, Mm -hmm. where's that should coming from? You know, what should we do? But I think the bigger the bigger point is that we we often just want to put put people in buckets and categories and 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 create these monoliths. You know, I mean, men, you know, all men are, you know, we 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 put like all men are this. Yeah. Right. Um, all Republicans are this, all all Democrats are this, you know, progressives, conservatives. I'm like, no, I think you know, majority of people are a combination of many things. And we just want to add that label to say, okay, this is how we categorize you. And then we're losing the dimensions of the complexity of each person. And that's why I think the, the, the approach of inquiry is so much more important than the, than the idea of, I'm going to show you the way. Mm -hmm. None of this is a one size fits all at this point. And it's nuanced and it's complex and we are complex. And so, um, breaking out of, because you are X, you should think like this Mm -hmm. and then life happens. It throws you a curveball, and then you're like, huh, what do I really think about it? Or like you said, the love transcends everything else Mm -hmm. and you start to figure out what your way is, you know, And, and still, how do you be in integrity with your own values? Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you're enjoying it and learning a lot. If you're looking for extra help, don't forget that I do offer one-on-one coaching. We can talk through a ton of different issues. I can give you guides, guidelines, and logistical help to help you take that next step or go to that next level in some of the things that you're dealing with in your life. We also have some course content, some guides, Uh, and a lot of educational materials over at maxedoutman.com. For the coaching, go ahead and go to maxedoutman.com slash coaching, and you can learn about that. And then just go to maxedoutman.com for everything else. Thanks for joining us. Now back to the episode. Yeah, and and in in our case, to to that point, it was like we had people that were like, you know, we we actually had 
more liberal people in our lives basically like judging us for not being out at a gay rally, you know, at a pride rally next weekend. And then we had conservatives going, well, I don't know what I would do if my, you know, I would do this, this, and this. And it's like, dude, you, neither one of you are going through this. So why don't you just shut up? (laughs) But, but it was interesting because again, everybody wants to label everybody and kind of put them in this thing. And I often wonder, Uh, Like in our case, uh, with with a lot of the people that we come in contact with, these are non-Christians. And for the most part, they don't know what to do with my wife and I, because, you know, we've been married for 28 years. We're conservative Christians. We love, you know, we're we're fairly loving people. I I think I told you before that my my kids call me the judgmental bastard, but I, I my actual interactions with people wouldn't wouldn't be indicative of that. But we were kind of the first Christians and conservatives that these people had come in contact with. And they often couldn't wrap their minds around it because they're like, wait, the people I see on the news that are wearing MAGA hats and, you know, trying to bash gay people and telling, you know, hate the environment and all of these things, like how do like, they don't know what to do with you because they're, they, they can't really wrap their mind around the fact that people are different. People are dynamic, you know, about that. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, the fact that you know a lot of my progressive friends when they when they hear that I will work with you know as a queer progressive minister <laughs> work with extremists and foreign white nationalists that are you know I'm like, how does that work? And I'm like, it just does, you know. And I, and I think it's you know part of this is the more we can defy some of this logic. And really show what what it means when we when we sh- share compassion and humanity with each other. Yeah, you know, and that you know, so many so many men right now are just lost, confused, frustrated, angry, um, and you know, how do we just show more compassion and humanity for each other? Yeah. And what, um, I want to be respectful of your time, but what, what, um, kind of where do men start to kind of begin this journey? Yeah. Yeah, Kind of how, how would you, obviously we want to have them go buy your book. That's a good start, but (laughs) but, you know, to kind of learn more of the interest intricacies of those things. But if someone's just like, I'm here, I'm exactly the guy that he's talking about. And, and I don't really know even how to begin to have the conversation with myself, right. um, to begin the process. You know, I, um, when I was in DC, when I lived in DC, before I moved to Philadelphia, I, um, I was pretty lonely in DC. It's a, it can be a hard place to, it's a great place to work. It's a hard place to live sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I created something called men's soul adventures dc outdoor adventure meets deeper male bonding meets soul connecting either uh, philosophical existential or spiritual awakening discussions and i didn't think i just was like i i just want to create community of of cool people who are conscious and want to want to explore uh i put it out on meetup 52 guys signed up in the first 24 hours wow i was not expecting that by the time I left DC, we had 180 guys in the group. Nice. And um, and it kind of, I started, I got, I got savvy at one point. I just started saying, so why, why a soul adventure? Why not just an adventure? Mm-hmm. And it came into the, the responses were three things. One, they just wanted to adventure, but just this sounded cool. So it was like, that was like a third of the group. Another third said they wanted deeper connection with other men. And then another third said they wanted to explore um, they wanted to explore spirituality on some level. Um, and they just had questions and they wanted to go deeper. And um, and so I started to just, you know, I think that the first step in my book that I talk about is the first step is find community with men and go do something. I don't necessarily think we need to sit in a room and I'm, I'm, I'm biased here, but <laughs> I, I sometimes I think, okay, if I'm just going to sit in a men's circle in a, in a room with four walls, that's going to drive me crazy. Mm-hmm. 
It's just that's not that's like I, I'm I'm horrible at, at mindfulness and meditation. Like I, I I do my own adaptation of what works for me. So I think to answer your question, I think one finding a way to connect with more men because I think the thing that happens when we can start breaking the ice, we realize the biggest thing we're not alone. Mm -hmm. We're not alone in what we're struggling with. Second thing I learned was with men and working with men, um, I would, I would put out like intimacy labs and relationship labs and, and all these things. And, and, and no, no one would ever come. <laughs> so I learned the power. It's not the head on collision. It's the drive by. Mm. And so in the drive by, I would take men out on, on a, uh, on a solo adventure. And then we do a little bit of like meditation or just listening and getting quiet. And the first one I did, I always do it the, the, the week after Easter, it's usually the week after Easter, right, uh, right, before, right after Passover in the middle of Ramadan. And, you know, so that's really a time of, of, of new beginnings and awakening. And, 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 and so I just kind of put that out there and I kid you not the moment I said, okay, so what, what, what are new beginnings for you? Every guy, I'm in a divorce, I'm getting divorced, I'm, I'm just out of, like, I'm in a breakup, I'm, and every guy wanted to talk about their relationships. I'm like, okay, so the drive-by, just create that invitation just enough. And, and two things happen. One, guys don't realize how deep they can go so quickly mm -hmm. and they, how much they're willing to share and be vulnerable. And two, again, that, that power of I'm not alone. So I think the first thing is um, look for some of those opportunities to just connect with with men on a deeper level, but do it in a way that works for you. Right. You know, um, and then I would say, you know, the second thing I often say is start to practice seeing the world with childlike wonder. And what do I mean by that? So many of us have had this idea that we have to be serious and we can't be playful. Or we've had to let go of, of the playful, the, the playfulness. And when you think about it, when we came out of the womb, we had everything we needed. You know, we had, we had all of it. We had, we had, we had our, our whole selves. And then day by day, piece by piece, certain, certain parts of us just started to like get suppressed, get rejected, get voted off the island. And so I think this work is really reclaiming that, mm -hmm. you know, I think this work is one, taking the time to discover the truth of who we are at our core, you know, in connection with our soul, you know, and then to see others as they are on their journey to discover themselves and they find their truth. And then to be able to, the biggest part is then to be able to accept both truths as true without one truth being better than the other. Right. And that's, I think the hardest part for folks. Yeah. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. The challenge. <laughs> from that place, that, that is the place where I think we can start to um, come into this work of humanity. But to your question, I think it's first two things to do. Um, find a community of guys. Mm-hmm start to play together, give each other permission to play and then give each other permission to go deep and then start to discover and be on a journey together. I love it. I think it's, I think it's great. And I think, you know, one of the, the, the best things about this podcast is to be able to have conversations that I ordinarily would not be able to have. Like, and this is, I think this is a great, ex a great example of that because obviously my background and your background and who you are and who I am, um, at the surface seems like they're in, you know, in a, in, in some ways they're diametrically opposed. Like I said, like if you look at our societal resume, right. but, but there's so much connection here that you and I can have and have this open and honest conversation, regardless of whether or not, uh, you know, we totally agree. One of my best friends is a, is an atheist and we can right. have that open and honest conversation without the vitriol that I think is a, is quote unquote expected of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, not that this is that diametrically opposed, but I think this is an awesome conversation. Yeah. I think that, I think hopefully this will serve as, 
as a as a learning experience and a good example for for people that that want to listen to it but hey tell me so it's it's warriorcompassion.com right it's warriorcompassion.com here's the com. here's the book nice yeah and this will i think we're probably a few weeks out from this launching so you'll we'll we'll be able to see that you'll have more than four or five star reviews i think like you had this morning so it's it's good it's better than four one star reviews it's true, <laughs> it's true. It's true. number number of people are buying the book and um people that have already ordered in the pre-sale they'll be getting their book in a couple of weeks nice so um yeah i'm excited i'm excited i'm uh, i'm starting to organize a 12 city tour across the country a book tour and um you know getting this uh, last night a, a buddy of mine started using the book and starting to create a curriculum for men's circles oh cool um and so uh finding new ways to just bring the message it's, for me it's less about buying the selling the book and more about just getting the message out yeah and did you do an audiobook version of it i did not not yet not yet well i might need that so you'll have to just record one you just have to record one for me personally so <laughs> you got it you got it, you got it. <laughs> i'm sure you do that for everybody you know uh Hey, anyway, Sean, thank you very much. I appreciate for uh, your time and for coming and sharing what you do. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very thankful for, for this time. And, and uh, I wish you the best with the new book and with the tour and with everything you're doing to kind of help men, you know, as we say, be who you were made to be, right? Like it, to, that's, that's our little tagline is to help people, you know, wherever you're starting, you could probably be, be, be not necessarily better, but be more than than you're than you are right now so i appreciate that very much and hope you have an awesome day uh, thank you so much it's been great being with you being with you if you're looking to really maximize your life and become the man you were made to be head over to maxedoutman.com and get your journey started today